بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة وتم التسليم على نبينا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين والتابعين لهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد Distinguished guests, dear participants, dear brothers and sisters, this is our pleasure to welcome you all to our weekly lecture on analyzing data of Islamic microfinance. Is it different from the conventional microfinance? And today's our guest speaker, Dr. Muhammad Ashraf al Mubin. Uh, we will be conducting the session, inshallah, today. Islamic Economics Association of Kuwait University is a global platform uh, which is trying to promote Sharia compliant financial strategies, policies, models, uh, by conducting seminars, talks, uh, programs, lectures, and also which is trying to conduct many uh, skill programs to, uh, to prepare our young generation and scientists, researchers for the future, and who will be the ambassadors of uh, Islamic uh, economics and finance to the global communities and stages. So we are trying to cover uh, various topics and areas of Islamic banking and finance, including banking, microfinance, insurance, capital market, equity market, FinTech, uh, digital marketing, and Sukuk, and also uh, many other contemporary topics. So a part of uh, the activities of Nadal Ektasad Dishtami, uh, today we are going to uh, listen to Dr. Mubin, who will be uh, conducting today's lecture on analyzing data of Dishtami microfinance, and is it different from the conventional microfinance? So Dr. Uh, Mohammed Ashwal Mubin is currently uh, the director of iFintel Business Intelligence, uh, financial data analytics, and who is also a fintech consulting agency based in uh, Kuala Lumpur. And Dr. Mobin is also serving uh, as a visiting academy in a few universities, including University of Malaya, University of Science Malaysia. And there uh, he teaches financial markets and institutions, and also Islamic capital markets. Prior to that, he served as an a uh, researcher specialist in Islamic Financial Service Board and at the Center of Social Innovation Patronas University as a research scientist. Dr. Mubin has completed his PhD in Islamic Finance from INSIF uh, and during his PhD he also led a few research projects on sustainability and Islamic finance and microfinance. And Dr. Mubin uh, also advised a uh, consulted different fintech uh, startups and also companies to develop their products to market and promote them, uh, who presented and moderated and reviewed more than 25 international conferences in the United Kingdom, Australia, Saudi Arabia, Maldives, Malaysia, Indonesia, and US. He has also been interviewed by local and international media on the issues of fintech and financial inclusions. His research works have been published uh, in top tier scholarly journals by recognized publishers. So uh, Dr. Mobin is going to join us in a while, in a minute, inshallah. So we are just waiting for Dr. Mobin. So I think uh, our participants from various countries, different countries uh, join here uh, to this session. And we thank you very much for joining us. Uh, Dr. Mobin already joined us. I think we need to make him admin or co-host. 
Yes, just says okay. Uh, I think you can do that now, Dr. Mubin. Yes. Uh, welcome, Dr. Muhammad Tashaful Mubin. Walaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, Dr. Mahiruddin Mahi. Thank you very much for introducing me, me and welcoming me to the session. Okay, let me see if I can allow the screen. Yeah, I think you can do that now. I think I can't allow. Okay, video is also working. Wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you very much. So, are you ready to start? Can you hear me clearly? Yes, please. Yes, we can start now. Okay, wonderful. Let me see if I can share my screen and if you can see it. Okay. Can you see my screen now? Yeah, yeah, it's clear now. Uh, okay, wonderful. So uh, we can start now, right? Okay, inshallah. I already, uh, you know, talked about the introduction of uh, okay, sure, sure, sure. and about your profile. So, alhamdulillah. So we can so begin. We start. Okay. okay, thank you very much, Dr. Mohiruddin Mahi. And and good evening in my time in Malaysia. So uh, this platform is not new for me. We are here actually for, uh, I was here actually for two times already. So this is third time. Last two times, uh, if you are the same participant, you know that I talk about the FinTech issues, the research and data analytics. And today we're going to discuss a very specific subject matter into Islamic microfinance. Previously, we discussed about the fintech, Islamic fintech, research data analysis. And today our focus will be into very specific subject matter, microfinance, how the data analytics can be applied for microfinance. And as this forum focus into promoting the Islamic financial system, so I'll be analyzing data for Islamic microfinance as well. And so there are two perspectives here. As you can see from the title, it's saying that analyzing data for Islamic microfinance, that's pretty simple, right? We understand that we will be analyzing the data for Islamic microfinance. But second part is a bit interesting. Is it different from conventional microfinance? So once we say, is it, what do we mean by it? Are we referring to microfinance? Is Islam microfinance different from conventional microfinance? Or we are referring to the analyzing data of Islam microfinance, the whole thing. The data analysis process of Islam microfinance, the process is different from conventional microfinance data analysis or not. So here you see the two issue. One is very specific to the Islamic microfinance. Is it different from conventional? Or the data analytics process, the research methodology, the methods and the techniques for analyzing Islamic microfinance different from conventional microfinance. So there are two issues here, right? So we will try to uh, address both issues at first we'll see if we do the data analysis for Islamic microfinance the process the methods the variables the data collections the techniques are this different secondly we will see also by comparing conventional and Islamic microfinance if the Islamic microfinance are different are you ready to start everyone uh, feel free to respond in the chat box Okay, one saying their voice is too low. Dr. Mike, can you hear me clearly now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's clear now. Yeah. Okay, cool. Well, so uh, you can respond me on the chat box and there will be a Q&A session at the end of the topic. 
So if you have a question, you can put the question during the session or at the Q&A part, actually. So I'll be, I'll be fine with the both, actually. So as Dr. Mahi already introduced me, so I'm not going to spend time on that. Rather, I'll be uh, proceeding with the presentation. And this, this particular presentation, I'll try to present in the research way. From my experience, most of the participants here from academia and also the participants who are interested in this topic from the industry, also interested into techn technical and technological part. So this presentation will be more into a, a research presentation manner. Okay, kind of academic presentation, but we will be addressing some industry specific issues as well. Okay, at first, let's talk about the microfinance. What do we understand by the word microfinance, right? Understanding the word microfinance is very important for today's discussion. Uh, the research objective, the research method, data analytics, all will be surrounding this particular word, microfinance. So you see here, we are not saying small finance. We are not saying medium finance. We are saying micro, micro finance means the amount, the loan that being provided, the financing that being provided is very, very small. It's such a small amount that we are not calling even small. We are calling it micro. Why we are calling it microfinance? Because the loan size is micro. Loan size is very small. That's what we are calling it microfinance. If the loan size is bigger, we call it small finance. If it's larger, it falls under the category of the corporate finance and other issues, right? But in today's class, in this microfinance, we are referring to very small amount of loan size. That what refer to microfinance. Again, please remember the word micro. Because, and this is a word that actually differentiates this financing from all other financing method. All the things, SME, corporate finance, all these things, business finance, microfinance is different because of the size of the loan. Even though the size of the loan is very small, as we call it micro but if we put together so many micro fish it can actually uh, hunt a shark like poverty right small 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 micro fish right but once it's come together it's big enough to kill the poverty that's the concept of microfinance Loan size, the amount very small. That's why we call it micro. But all micro together can be big enough to kill a shark like poverty, a big shark, right? So if we are clear till this part, let's go back to the next point, some of the features of the microfinance. Very first point, microfinance provides micro-sized loans. I hope we are clear on the point. Second point is that, I mean, uh, if you have a house, if you have some property, uh, a small amount of loan will not help you much. But for someone who does not have any, any property or a business or anything that can be used as a collateral, it's a very significant amount for him or her to get rid of the poverty cycle. That's why usually the micro-sized loans are given to those people who does not even a, does not have even a proper collateral, right? And of course, we know that it serves the poorest of the poor. This poorest of the poor in some countries is B20, below 20%, B40. It depends from country to country, uh, but 
this part referring to the poorest of the four. And of course, the microfinance is supported by the donors. But one thing to remember very clearly, yeah? microfinance is a business, not a charity. It's a business, not a charity. Please remind also remember this point as well. So in one hand, we are ensuring some of the social objectives to kill the poverty, to help the poorest of the poor, to provide the loan without the collateral. At the same time, it's not a charity, it's a business. Once it's a business, business means making money. Business means generating revenue. Correct? So, in one hand, you are trying to achieve some social objectives to serve the poor, poorest of the poor, to serve the poor who does not have a property to use as a collateral, right? On the other hand, you are doing a business, financing business, intermediary business, that you also want to be financially sustainable. You want to make money out of this microfinance business. So you have two goals. In one hand, you want to help the poor, on the other hand, you want your business to be sustainable and money making means financial objectives. <laughs> right? So now you see these social objectives and financial objectives sometimes can be very confusing. You are trying to help someone, but at the same time, you are trying to make money out of that business. That sounds fine. That can be business that you help. At the same time, you make money out of that. But the problem happens, right? By helping that people, if it's think like that, if I don't help you that much, if I help you, if I help him less, but I can make more money by helping him less. Right? For example, if you give the money to the poorest of the poor, very small size of the amount, micro amount, right? It helps the poor people. But then you see the cost per borrower is very high and financially not sustainable. But if you make the amount much bigger, small amount of participants, then you don't serve the poorest of the poor, but financially is more sustainable. But by attaining this financial objective, you are actually living your social objectives what we call the mission drift understanding this mission and mission drift is very important to understand the concept of microfinance microfinance mission and also how it can be different from islamic microfinance in islam we have the islamic social finance zakat sadaka waqaf and many other tools, right? In conventional, conventional microfinance, of course, interest-based, not the Sharia compliant, usual conventional microfinance is interest-based. That's a rebuy part of that. So microfinance, by definition, not necessarily Sharia compliant. In Islamic microfinance, we remove the non-Sharia compliant part, the rebuy part, the gara part, the mysid part, and make it Sharia compliant. So to go to that point, we also need to understand this particular part first. What exactly the mission of the microfinance and how the microfinance can be drifted from its mission. Few things never forget. Number one, the word microfinance. Amount of the loan is micro. Second point, double bottom line. Microfinance has two objectives social and financial objectives. So providing small amount, very small amount of financing, micro size of financing, microfinance business needs to achieve both social objectives and financial objectives. They need to maintain this trade-off. Okay, so it's a challenge. So what is it? The mission of microfinance to serve the poorest. Clear. But recently 
if you look at the literature, academic literature, if you listen to the industry practitioners, the critics you'll find they are saying that microfinance is shifting towards less poor clients. Understand, right? This is very important. Microfinance, micro size loan, but they are shifting from very poor to less poor because the poor or the less poor they can they need they have some collateral in some cases and they can actually get the bigger size of the larger size of the loan and the cost of borrower is lower so that that particular microfinance institution can be more financially sustainable right when the mission drift workers mission drift workers when a microfinance institutions begins to shift its target audience from the poor to the wealthier borrowers. Why they do it? For attaining financial sustainability means they are actually sacrificing or compromising their social objectives to attain the financial sustainability. Uh, I will show you actually on hypothetical table. What do we mean by mission oriented microfinance or mission drifted microfinance? Okay. Here you see, uh, uh, imagine that there are two microfinance institutions, right? Number one, that served 100,000 borrowers. 100,000 poor people are being served by this microfinance. Another microfinance institutions, they serve 10,000 borrowers, 10,000 poor people. Look at here again. They are serving 100,000 and they are serving 10,000. Once they serve 100,000, you see the average loan size is 200. And their average loan size is 2,000. Loan portfolio is the same, $20 million. So $20 million is disbursed by two microfinance institutions. The first microfinance institution disbursed this $20 million to 100,000 people. And second microfinance institutions disbursed this $20, 20 million to 10,000 each. So here you see the loan size is 200, which is micro size. But here you see $2,000. The size may not be micro anymore. But still, it's not a problem. When the problem happens, here you see the mission-oriented microfinance. Their cost per borrower is forty dollar, cause, and here actually cost per borrower is higher, say hundred dollar. Okay, so the operating expense for a uh, million dollar because of hundred thousand to forty dollar, four million dollar, and their operating expenses become one million dollar. Okay, so here you see the interesting point, right? Just because their loan size is higher, number of borrowers are lower, even the cost per borrower is higher, their operating expense becomes four times lower than the mission-oriented microfinance, right? So if you look at the average income, $5 million here, $5 million here, but the profit for this one is $4 million and for this one is $1 million. So for a microfinance institution, of course, it's more lucrative to serve low number of clients and larger size and to make more profit because uh, cost per borrower even is bigger. Still, because of the Lower, lower, higher loan size and lower number of borrowers, they can make more profit. But for a microfinance was target to go for larger number of borrowers, even with the small loan size, they can't make the profit that much this microfinance can achieve. So this is why we call it the mission drifted microfinance that is actually compromising the mission of solving the poor to achieve a financial profit. Okay, so that's actually there on a hypothetical table what I was talking about the mission drift of 
microfinance institutions. Right? Uh, if it's clear, I'll go to the some of the literature review. If you're an academician, you know uh, anything that we see or we say or we see in the research that had to be supported by uh, some of the literature, some of the previous studies or theories. So all the argument that we had made in this research or in this analysis that actually backed by uh, some of the literature uh, you can see from 2009, 2010, 2015, 2017, uh, they actually talk about the mission drift, right? The profit motive may cause mission drift, mission drift exist, cost efficiency outweigh the profit motive. The innovative practices help to avoid mission drift. This is very interesting. The innovative practices help to avoid mission drift. Take note on that. Profit motive cause mission drift. Same uh, finding as this paper. The non-profit NGOs are more likely to face mission drift. NGOs, non-profit, they are more likely to face uh, mission drift. This is the finding of this. So there are quite a few research been done and different papers as different findings. But one finding by the May at all 2015 is that innovative practices help to avoid mission drift from a cross country study that give us the indication that if the Islamic microfinance, we consider it as uh, innovative to the conventional, not innovative to the community, it's been practiced for long, uh, does it help to avoid the mission drift? What's actually happening in Islamic microfinance compared to conventional? That's what we will try to analyze in today's uh, class, in today's session, actually. Uh, we had the analysis done, of course, I wish I had enough time actually to teach you step-by-step -step process of all the data analytics method. But uh, as you know, we don't have enough time. And uh, so I can't go for the R language, MATLAB, and Stata, and all the advanced software that we have been used to analyze this, uh, to do the analysis. But what I can do, uh, can share with the result, the methodology and data analytics process that will help you to understand the details. OK. So uh, from the literature, there were some research gap in terms of mission drift. Uh, there are some contradictory results. And from the regional perspectives, uh, when uh, there are not enough comprehensive research, lack of empirical investigation, why the mission drift happening? And the mission drift study not been done for the Islamic microfinance institutions. OK, and of course, the threshold. We are talking about the social objective and financial objectives. You may argue that uh, Dr. Mobin, you are saying that social objective and financial objective both are important for the microfinance institutions. Then how do we determine being a policymaker or being an academic? What exact the threshold point for microfinance institutions? Like, OK, this is your social objective or this is your financial objective. You make profit up to this level. You serve the borrowers up to this level. You make the loan size up to this level. Then you stop. You can't go beyond that. What exact the threshold point? So previous research, they did not handle these issues. So in this analysis, we also talk about finding that exact threshold point uh, of different determinants. OK, um, so but for today's class, our very specific question is, does the religion of Islam make any difference in achieving microfinance mission, microfinance institutions mission? The, what we mean by that, the Islamic microfinance, the principle of Islamic religion, uh, does it make any difference? <clears throat> Please excuse me. So if you look at the some picture of Islam microfinance by institution type, so this uh, microfinance institution that collected from here actually, uh, just an overview, some of them are fully Islamic, some of them are mixed, uh, the outreach award according to the CGAP, right? Global survey of Islam microfinance. So they collect the data from the 105 rural banks in Indonesia. 
that from the Indonesia Central Bank 2007 statistics. Then we also have the outreach of 4,500 cooperatives. And then we also took the data actually from other institutions, from Middle Eastern, from Yemen, from Syria, from Bangladesh, from India, and all other places that uh, microfinance institution run by Islamic principles, not the microfinance institution in Muslim countries. We are not considering that as a Islamic microfinance because most of the microfinance, for, for example, the birthplace of the modern microfinance is Bangladesh. There are like thousands of microfinance institutions, very few of them run by Islamic principles. So we are not considering them as Islamic microfinance. What we mean by Islamic microfinance, the microfinance institutions that run by the principles of Islamic finance, for example, no riba, no karar, no maisi, like that. So uh, that is a data is a bit old, uh, was not many survey done on this thing, microfinance and by the policymakers. But one of the reliable source that we can collect the data is actually the CGAP. Uh, this actually one of the pioneer body and reliable uh, cross country body, I would say, for microfinance data is a subsidiary of the World Bank. Uh, if you go to the Google and look for their CGAP, you'll find the data, the analytics and things. Empowering for poor, the financial services. So yeah, you can find all the data and things like regarding microfinance. You look at the research and here you see the digital banks and all other theme, the survey regarding Islamic microfinance, all others. You can find, you can go for their search box here and look for Islamic. And yep can find some all the blogs and the data for Islamic microfinance in Yemen, in Tanzania, in Pakistan, and all other details um, that you can talk about. You can also use that for your research. Anyway, going back to our topic. So this is one of the like over, um, if you look at the average loan size is 132, 800, 303, Royal Bank Indonesia 1,640, and BFI, 595, 305. So here you see for the banking institutions, their legal type is very clear, it's bank, right? For other institutions, right, cooperative and others, usually in the they have a very specific legal type in a very specific jurisdiction. But once this comes to microfinance, it's quite mixed and quite diverse in some countries microfinance institutions, they consider as a bank or a, a bank for the village bank like that. In some countries, microfinance operate as a cooperatives. In some countries, it's a NGO. Yeah, even in some countries, the microfinance that provide the micro amount of loans that can be non-bank financial institutions or commercial banks even, they provide, provide sometimes the micro amount of loan, loan, sometimes as part of the CSR program and sometimes they have the different scheme. For example, Islamic Bank Bangladesh Limited, they have the scheme, uh, rural development scheme, a microfinance scheme, but it's a commercial bank. Then in uh, Indonesia, they have Baitul Malo Tamil, uh, there's a different structure. In Malaysia, you have Amanahta Malaysia, in Pakistan, you have Akhuat. So in different countries, you have different structure of this. Even sometimes within the same country, you will find actually different legal types of microfinance institutions that are providing the micro amount of loans. Now, the, nowadays, we have actually those uh, fintech organization that provide the micro amount of loans and quite a few rising. So you can also look into that. We have the kiva.org. We have some of these time microfinance institutions. They're also working on the, uh, those ideas, right? So if you look into these by country for Islam microfinance, as uh, I'm saying again, it's a, a bit old data, uh, but that was the best I could find like when I did the research before the COVID-19. Uh, so that's the data I had available from the collect resources. This data uh, might be a bit outdated, so if any of the participants have a better data set, please feel free to communicate with me. At the end of the slide, you will find my email, my WhatsApp, and the website. Uh, if you can provide me the 
updated data of the Islamic microfinance institutions. We will be very happy uh, to acknowledge and also to collaborate in different programs. Okay, so this is the outreach of Islamic microfinance by country. Mm, now, once it's come to the analysis of microfinance, right? Uh, the main thing that we struggle is actually what data we have available for Islamic microfinance or microfinance institutions. If you think right, the variables that we use for banking performance, financial institution performance might not be suitable for Islamic microfinance performance. Of course, in a microfinance or an Islamic microfinance, let's say a microfinance in general, it is two uh, double bottom line, two objectives achieving the uh, social objectives at the same time achieving financial objectives. Social objective is to help the poor, financial objectives to make revenue, to make money, to say it in a simple way. But in a banking institution, it has only one objectives to make money. Uh, what we call in, in terms of finance, uh, maximizing the profit, maximizing the wealth of the shareholders, right? That's the objective, but in microfinance it's different. So if we measure the microfinance, if we do the analysis of microfinance, using the same indicators of the commercial banks, it's not going to be right. That's why in microfinance institution, microfinance research, we have a different set of indicators. Uh, also, if you look at the CGAP, actually, which is really one of the subsidies of World Bank, they have a different set of indicators that uh, set for microfinance research. Let me see if I can find out for you. And I can share in the chat box. Look at the CGAP indicators. Just one second. Right, they are usually find the, all the, there are quite a few uh, CGAP indicator like measuring results of microfinance institutions where you can see all the tools, the measurement here, right? Data, the provider certificate, everything. Measuring as microfinance institutions, and you can find many indicators how to calculate these indicators and everything in details. For example, this particular document by CGAP. Right? How do you measure the result of microfinance institutions? As I said before, CGAP is a subsidy of World Bank. Okay, uh, some of the at first outreach, which is very important, number of clients served, the number of borrowers, outreach, how depth, the client poverty level, loan repayment, the financial sustainability, the profitability, the efficiency. So all these indicators should be different from the commercial banks. The way you measure the banking institutions the microfinance institutions should not be measured the same way. The indicators, the efficiency level, the performance should be measured different way. If we measure the two institutions, the same structure, then actually we are not doing the justice. Uh, institutions that does not even have the objective of only financial profitability, if we measure it by only financial indicators, financial profitability indicators, then actually we are not doing the right thing in terms of the research and data analytics, right? So once it's come to microfinance, you see the indicators here, the justification, the details, how do you measure the outreach, right? Usually we measure the outreach by average outstanding balance or average loan size, and we adjust by uh, gross national income or uh, GNI per capita. Then we have loan portfolio, right and the riskiness of the loan then yep we have many other indicators that you can use that is very specific to the microfinance institutions besides the indicators that we can use for the bank you can use that but 
not only that, right? So yeah, this is one of the documents that FSS and OSS. These are two documents that we look to understand the performance, financial sustainability of the microfinance, FSS financial self-sufficiency. Then we have the OSS operational self-sufficiency. Uh, then these are the, some of the indicators that we can use for microfinance regarding data analytics. Okay, going back to the point here. So the average loan size, this is one of the most important variable or the indicator. As you remember at the very beginning, I'd said micro finance, micro amount of the loan size, right? So that's what defines the microfinance. So if the loan size becomes bigger, then number of borrowers become smaller. And that actually destroy the purpose of microfinance institutions in many cases. Okay, and this data you can actually collect also from another data source for the microfinance. They call it MIX, Microfinance Information Exchange. Uh, simply go to the Google, look for MIX, microfinance data. You will find the MIX market. Okay, now the mixed market is also bought by World Bank. So you can get the mixed market data from here. Right, simply you select the country, you select the variable, and you will be able to download the data. That's really good. Previously, we had to actually buy the data from the mixed market. I think now it's easy for you uh, to just download it from here. You have the country basis data for many variables for microfinance, right? You can select the variables that you want, the database, all these world development indicators, statistical indicators, microfinance indicators, right? Then you also have this series data, time series data. So you can get the microfinance data from this, the active agents, the ATMs, the merchants, admin expenses, average asset, average deposit account balance. So all the indicators actually, uh, you can find from here. Operational self-sufficiency, so the research on microfinance become much easier than before. Okay, then there are some other determinant variables like microfinance interest rate, subsidy dependency. If you remember one of the points that we had mentioned earlier, how the microfinance dependent on the donor subsidy or not. We'll talk about that too. The legal status, as I said, microfinance can be in different legal status and for different legal types, the analytics can be different. In different microfinance size, analytics can be different. The risk assessment, it can be different. Now, how old or how new microfinance? So if we don't, if we compare a new microfinance to a old microfinance, it will be different the analytics, right? Analysis. But if you pull all these up together, then we are not doing the right thing. We need to uh, differentiate between the old to new, right? On the scale uh, of the microfinance institutions, the small and the big and all other things, right? Okay. And even the small thing and big thing in different region, this scale should be different. For example, uh, $2,000 or yeah, let's say $2,000 in MANA region or in the Gulf countries may be considered as a micro loan or small size loan, right? But this $2,000 in African, some of the countries might be considered as a comparatively larger size loan. But, and so that's why actually we also need to define the scale of the loan according to the region. Then, of course, the target market and and then there are some other variables that we need to include it. We need to include some of the variables that need to be included. Uh, macroeconomic variable, of course, from one country to another country, if it can be different. So if we do a cross country analysis, we need to include the macroeconomic variables as well. So in the slide, you can find actually all the major uh, indicators of microfinance research and their data sources as well. So that will help you 
later. So as I don't have much time, I will jump to the methodology and data section. Uh, the method for these analytics that I had used, GMM, fixed effect, random effect, and uh, dynamic panel threshold analysis by Kramer 2013, and some of the latest technique that uh, been released in 2017 and 2018, data collected from the mix, uh, now is under World Bank, and of course, the IFS database of the IMF. Total sample is 2,231. Initially, sample was 4,000 plus. Then I had to clean some of the data uh, that was not clean or, rela or uh, reliable because you know microfinance data collection process can be different, um, and sometimes the audit not properly done, bookkeeping not bookkeeping not properly done. So we had to rely on the reliable data. Okay, and then this is some of the equations. Uh, how actually we determine, we do the analysis. Here we put the social performance SP, and here we put the financial performance, right? And then we have all other control variables. So we are trying to look into effect of financial performance into social performance, and also the effect of all other relevant variables. This is number one. Number two, we want to look into what level of financial performance, what exact threshold of financial performance are suitable for the social performance? These two things. Uh, these are some of the outcome that you can see. At first, these are some of the outcome for dependent thing, the religion of Islam, the Islamic microfinance making a difference. As you can see, yeah, Here, at first, number one thing is that we don't find enough evidence that mission drift is happening in the Islamic microfinance. While by analyzing the 2000 plus conventional microfinance institutions, we can see the evidence of mission drift. But in Islamic microfinance, even though the sample size is smaller, but the the, it's the microfinance that we have, if we analyze it, we can see the evidence of mission drift is not there. We don't have enough evidence to say that there is mission drift or Islam microfinance is deviating from this mission. So that might be the reason behind that the innovative structure of Islam microfinance or the inbuilt solution that we have in the Islam microfinance that actually binding it to its original mission of serving the poor. Right, then we have the threshold. Uh, here you can see the level of 1.1 percent, and, and this is actually the level of financial performance. Okay, up to this level, you are allowed to make your profit and to compromise the social performance, but also these thresholds are different in different regime, in different region in different age group. So we can't just conclude that this is the ultimate threshold level. We can't just say that microfinance institutions just follow this threshold and that is sufficient uh, regardless the country, the region, the religion, no. In different perspectives, in different contexts, the threshold of social, finance, social objective and financial objectives will be different. OK, so and you can see the interest rate. OK, one thing here, this is a bit more technical, but I will try to make it as lemon as possible. Once we say the word threshold means, for example, we are saying one microfinance institution is its threshold level is 75% 70, 70 of the profit. Because actually this indicator is a uh, measurement of the FSS financial self-sufficiency, which is quite complicated. But just for the example, say 70% of the profit is allowed and that's the threshold level. So below 70%, the interest rate 
the subsidy dependency, all others will affect in a way. And beyond that threshold level, it will affect different way. We call it regime effect. Another questions we try to answer here, which is very interesting. And it might be relevant for your study, not only for microfinance, for many other studies. You see, we always say the charity or subsidy. Charity or subsidy is good to have the poor. But up to what level? Right? What I'm trying to say, in one hand, charity or subsidy help the poor people. In other hand, after a certain time, it makes them lazy. What do I mean by it makes them lazy? Let me tell you. In this analysis, at first, our hypothesis was that subsidy is good for microfinance institutions. Donors should support the microfinance institutions. That in my analysis, I don't have the complete analysis here, complete analytics that only the outcome, output, I have around 50 tables. And there's like 50 different pages. Of course, I can't put all this in the slides. It's just like uh, some brief of the analytics that were analysis that I have done. So in the result, initially, I found that subsidy has a negative effect on the microfinance performance. And all the hypotheses, the literature was supported. No, 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 subsidy has a positive effect. Subsidy, we need the subsidy. The industry, people are saying that the literature are arguing that subsidy is very needed. But my analysis is saying that, no, subsidy can be bad. And I was like, what's wrong? What did I do wrong? I mean, I go through all the analysis again, the methodology. And I find that, OK, all the methods are correct. Data collection and everything is fine. Variables are proper. There was a the problem. Then I started going to the literature again. And at one point, I found that uh, some of the authors are agreeing subsidy is good for up to a certain threshold. After that certain threshold, subsidy is not good. Then I run the threshold analysis. And I found here, as you can see from here, at the first regime up to a certain level, subsidy has a positive effect. It's a plus sign, right? It affects 1.9% rate. But after that threshold, it has a negative effect. It affects negatively at 3.4% rate. You see, subsidy dependency, good up to a certain level. After that level, subsidy affects the microfinance institutions negatively. So this is another interesting finding that we have found in this uh, analytics of the Islamic microfinance data. So what are the summaries? We found that the mission drift exists in the global sample, the conventional microfinance. And we studied, like as I say, 2000 plus institutions from different region. And uh, in Latin America, uh, we have more and strong evidence, but other region less. And we found the interest rate. It has significant impact. But for the Islamic microfinance institutions, we did not find to have enough evidence of mission list. So we can say Islamic microfinance institutions are different from conventional microfinance institutions based on the analysis that we have done. And of course, the threshold exists at different level. And the subsidy, interest, and dependent cost efficiency, all these behave differently in different regimes. So these are some of the contributions that studies made and some of the policy implications. Uh, of course, if you're an academician or the policymaker or the industry player from this kind of analysis, um, you can formulate the policy to help you how to choose the right variable, how to choose the right method, and how to analyze the microfinance data. And specifically for Islam microfinance, as we have very small amount of data set. So choosing the right method is very important. And also to cleaning and treating the data is also very important. And we need to be very careful once it's come to Islamic microfinance analyzing data. Uh, for two reasons. Number one, that Islam microfinance are different by structure 
from conventional microfinance because of the no interest, no gear, color, no MICE, all this policy. At the same time, data is, is uh, smaller and many of the variables you find not relevant to Islam microfinance. That's why uh, even the analysis process of Islam microfinance are a bit different from the conventional microfinance. So these are two very uh, specific uh, specificities for Islam microfinance once it's come to data analytics. And if we have further question, even after this class, uh, you can always contact me. This is my WhatsApp number uh, and this is my email. We have one learning center where we teach all the certificate programs on data analytics. Uh, we have two months, one week, three months, different range of certificate programs on data analytics, machine learning, the research data analysis, all the software from SPS Stata to Python, Matlab, uh, we teach there for academicians, for the uh, research institutions. We also have the consultant thing, consultancy firm, uh, consultancy things that we do. So if you have any query or any request, and if you want to know further or you want to collaborate, feel free to WhatsApp us or communicate us through email. We'll be very happy uh, to collaborate. So that's all for now. And I would like to open the session for the Q&A. Yeah, thanks very much, yeah, Doctor, for this wonderful and informative session and analytical discussion. So we thank you very much. And I think now uh, we can open the floor for any questions or any comments from the uh, our online guest. Please, if you have any question or comment, uh, you may raise your hand or you may write in the question box. Yeah, I think Dr. Ideas, uh, please welcome uh, Dr. Ideas. Yes, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Thank you, Dr. Salim. Thank you, Dr. Muhammad, for your presentation. Uh, actually, I have uh, some of the comments. You mentioned in the, the presentation that we have uh, two objectives, financial and social objectives on the Islamic microfinance. And I think from my opinion, this is not a true. Why? Because uh, both depending on the financial objectives. And if the size and the volume of the Islamic microfinance is greater than that on the conventional uh, microfinance, we can say that they're depending on the social objectives. Otherwise, we cannot say that uh, Islamic uh, microfinance uh, uh, depending on the social objectives. Uh, so this is the first issue. The second thing, uh, in uh, slide number 11, uh, the data that uh, presented, it is related on 2007. I think if uh, we depend on the data in 2007, this will uh, uh, weak the research. And also, <clears throat> I think from my opinion, and please forgive me, Dr. Muhammad, <laughs> on this, I think this is an academic lecture, uh, more than public lecture, because uh, it is a research and you use methodology data, okay? I expect from this uh, public lecture, uh, things like uh, the numbers of the, uh, and the size of the Islamic microfinance, uh, how we can use uh, the Islamic uh, microfinance and increase it uh, by, uh, on the Islamic banking by using different uh, modes like mudaraba, murabaha, and uh, data related to the uh, Islamic microfinance uh, from different countries and uh, what is the weaknesses and uh, how we can make an advantage when we grant Islamic microfinance. So please, again, forgive me for this. Just this is my opinion. Okay, and thank you very much. Your presentation is uh, excellent. And thank you, uh, Dr. Mahdeen, again, for this uh, nice presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Elias. If uh, Dr. Mahi allowed me to respond yes. uh, to a very wise comment of the doctor. Okay, uh, number one thing is the doctor. Uh, once I defined the uh, two objectives, that was not very specific, only for microfinance. So that double bottom line that actually refer to uh, microfinance in general 
not to the Islamic microfinance. If you can refer to the feature of microfinance, so the beginning, this double bottom line I mentioned uh, is relevant to both uh, conventional and Islamic. But the literature, uh, all the discussion on the microfinance institutions that refers to these uh, on the microfinance feature, number one. Number two is that, uh, okay, regarding the data, data not from 2007, data is actually collected from 2017. If you look at the data structure, it is mentioned here, until uh, 2010 to 2016, that's actually data collection period. And the research then uh, updated until COVID-19 time, as I mentioned in one of the discussion. So data collection period 2010 to 2016, but the indicators that was produced from one of the 2007 paper that was published by the World Bank of the CGAP. This is the first time they come up with the microfinance uh, specific indicators. And on your third comment, uh, for the academic style lecture, as I mentioned very early actually, we wanted to make it academic. Uh, and I said before, the fa uh, first two lectures that I had on the public lecture, FinTech and analytics, but this lecture, because uh, my from experience, there are so much academicians present, so I wanted to make it academic. That was a purpose. Uh, so I mentioned at the beginning, actually, it has the industry implications because uh, this research also been fruitful for many industries that I work with, for example, microfinance regulatory authority in Bangladesh, in Pakistan, in Indonesia, and also in Malaysia. Uh, from this research and the findings, very specifically on the threshold part of the microfinance, they have been benefited. So I believe it has a food for the thought for the industry practitioner as well. But uh, of course, uh, I respect your comment. And I think uh, some of the things maybe I'll try to make it clearer in future presentation. So it removes the confusion. Thank you very much again. Thank you, Dr. Bobin, uh, for the clarification. And in fact, we, uh, we don't only focus uh, in the public lectures, uh, Nabilak Tasawad Islami uh, is focusing on a variety of uh, activities, including public lectures and academic lectures, and also theoretical. And you can see that workshops also we are conducting, which are uh, mostly uh, academic and also uh, based on research. So. Uh, Dr. Elias, in fact, is our regular participant. So thank you very much, uh, Dr. Elias, for your comment. And we try to actually, uh, you know, uh, maximize uh, the nature of our activities. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, Sister Salma, thank you so much. Okay, you are most welcome. Sister Sajan Kamal, how will we get our certificates? You know, we, we do have a website www.sharia.org. So you will see there, Madaraj is Tari Shahadat. Minasut Madaraj is Tari Shahadat. So you key in your information and the program that you attended. So our committee will send you an email with the password and how to receive a certificate. So that is the way. Uh, to uh, get your certificate. Thank you. Any more question or any more comment from the guest? We still have some time to respond to your questions or comments. Uh, Abdul Rahim Brahim, yes, uh, Abdul Rahim, please welcome. Abdul Rahim, Abdul Rahim Ibrahim, please. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Abdurrahim, Ibrahim, are you with us? Anyone else? Anyone? Does anyone has any more question or comment? I think Mustafa Abdurrahim, his mic was muted. Uh, I think he mistakenly raised the hand. Hmm. 
Muhammad Usman, yes. Muhammad Usman, please welcome. Yeah. Mah Mahmoud Uthman, please welcome. Yeah. Hello. Oh. Yeah. Yes, please. First of all, I wanna to uh, thank you the Nadir Iqtisad al-Islami for his commitment. Uh, my question is, what is the major difference between the Islamic microfinance and conventional microfinance? Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Muhammad. There is the same difference that we have between Islamic finance and conventional finance. They are from two angles. One is the sum of the prohibition. In Islamic microfinance, we can't have riba, we can't have uncertainty at the gambling level, we can't have the corruption. Some of the basic principles of the Islamic financial system so applies to the Islamic microfinance. Point number two, all the transactions that we do in Islamic microfinance, all the contract that has to be based on some Muqtad al some Islamic financial contract, like Mudarabba, Musharaka, Salam, Istisna, uh, Kard Hassan, Waqaf, Zaka, so Sadaka, all these different, different mode, it must have to be based on any of the mode. So we have different lectures on how the microfinance product microfinance services, microfinance based sukuk, microfinance based different kind of instrument. So there we discuss in details actually all the microfinance model that been implemented in Indonesia by Tulmala Tamil, in Malaysia we have the Aman Ehtia Malaysia, in uh, Pakistan with Akhwat Kard Hassan based. So in different countries we have different model been implemented for Islam microfinance, but all have actually different structure. Some are based in Mudaraba, some based in Musharaka, some based in Salam, some Istisna, and result can be different uh, compared to conventional. Dr. Mai, if we have time, I want to give an example actually to clarify. Yes, please. More. Yes, please. Yeah. Okay. Sure. For example, right, in Islamic banks, right, we have this perception. If we go for Mudaraba, Musharaka, and the banks don't like it, it's more risky, it's high risk instrument but the clients like it. So I did actually market research uh, in Bangladesh for Islamic microfinance institutions. For example, uh, RDS, Rural Development Scheme of IBBL, Islamic Bill Bangladesh Limited. So I was interviewing some of the officers there and they are saying that their experience are different. The clients, they don't prefer the Mudaraba Musharaka, rather they prefer uh, the markup based contract. I was actually thundered. I mean, we all studied, we argued that the banks don't want Mudaraba Musharaka, but clients want that because, you know, the profit sharing and loss bearing, loss will be bared by the uh, Rappel Ma, right? So, why is different? Then he's saying that if we go for the Mudaraba Musharaka, maybe uh, profit ratio is 50 50. But if we go for the markup, is 15%, 20%, 25% like that. So the farmer or the client, he prefers high risk, lower markup. You see the experience for Islamic microfinance can be different from Islamic banks, not only from the contract perspectives, not only from the Sharia regulation perspectives or legal perspectives, but also practice perspectives the way the client behave, the way the customer responds. Or if, so there are many other differences, not only from the Shoya or legal perspectives, but also business perspectives you'll face on this company's line microfinance. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, we do have another brother, Bangali Mahmoud Kaba. Please welcome, brother Mahmoud. Thank you very much, from Doctor, for this grand lecture. My question is about microfinance. How 
we can get this microfinance in African countries. Like, for instance, in Guinea, how is the proposal that we can get uh, this microfinance uh, in uh, this country? Yeah. Uh, is the question how to get the data for microfinance for Guinea? Is it? Yeah, Guinea? yeah, Islamic, yeah. Okay. So I think is yeah. Yeah. one of the source that you can always refer is the mixed market. Okay, this mixed market yeah. from the World Bank data set, you can go there. You can look for a country if it's available. Uh, let's look for that. Okay, you see here? You have Guinea here, right? So you can get the data for the Guinea from this uh, World Bank data set, the mixed market. That's one of the reliable sources besides many other sources and CGAP other places. Hope you got done, sir. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Brother Mahmoud from Guinea, and thank you, Dr. Ashraf al -Mubin. I think we don't have any more question or comment. So on behalf of the Islamic Economics Association, Nadir Iqtisad al-Islami, Jami'at al-Kuwait, we would like to thank all participants from around the world for joining us and for your comments, for your questions, for your participation, and may Allah bless you all. And we thank our administration, especially our Dr. Al al Director General of uh, the Association, and our special thanks uh, to uh, Dr. Muhammad Ashraf al Mubin, uh, today's guest speaker, for uh, presenting his uh, wonderful and informative lecture and for this uh, analytical discussion. And we thank you very much. Jazakumullah khairan, barakallahu fikum. So, Dr. Uh, Mubin, if you have a few words, yes, please. Uh, thank you very much to the organizer, to Dr. Mahi, and to all the participants for the attention and the patience, and also to those participants who asked the questions. And uh, if you have further questions or query, please feel free to communicate with me or to the organizer. We'll be very happy uh, to help you or to learn from me as well, to learn your experience and to collaborate uh, to take it to the further to make the world a better place. Thank you, everyone. You are most welcome, and we hope to see you again in upcoming events and activities. Inshallah. And may Allah bless you all. With that, we conclude our today's session here. Subhanakallahumma bihamdik. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa ant. Astaghfiruka wa atubu ilaik. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.